All right, our next speaker is Eric Reinhard, who's going to deliver an assessment of reference levels in HDR content, uh, focused on, uh, similar to some talks from this morning, an actual evaluation of uh, the creative process taking advantage of these technologies we work on. Uh, Eric Reinhardt has served as distinguished scientist at Technicolor RNI since July 2013. He was founder and editor-in-chief of ACM Transactions on Applied Perception and has authored books on high dynamic range imaging, color imaging, computer graphics, and natural image statistics. Please welcome Eric. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. This is my first time, so I have uh, one of these newbie ribbons uh, on, my, uh, on my badge. Um, my talk is about reference levels. Uh, before I get there, um, I started off uh, my academic career as, uh, as, uh, as someone in computer graphics, and that was 3D um, complicated stuff. 3D, too many dimensions. And then in about uh, the year 2001, I discovered uh, that I can reduce the dimensionality of the problems that I solved. So I started looking at uh, tone mapping and high dynamic range imaging. Very interesting. One dimension, much easier. Um, but then I realized that perhaps I'm still, I'm still overcomplicating things. And uh, as a consequence today, I would like to talk to you about, uh, well, it says reference levels, but really what I mean is reference level. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, white. Only one color, just one number. Much, much, much easier to think about. So, here's uh, an example. <laughs> so, uh, but, I mean, this is an image. I downloaded it myself off the internet. Uh, it's an actual photograph. Um, you might ask yourself, if you have to shoot this, this image itself, and you had to set your diffuse white level of your camera, what level would you pick? I mean, everything here is pretty much diffuse. Light reflects in all directions. Um, you could make an endless number of images uh, with, uh, with each of these points in your image as, as the target. So what are you going to pick? Um, so with that in mind, we can look uh, at, uh, at recommendations that are out there in the field. Uh, the one that I know about is, uh, is coming from ITU and, uh, and from my, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Andrew Cotton has, uh, has uh, uh, been instrumental in, in getting this document together. This is uh, uh, ITUR report BT2408, very useful. Uh, and in it you will find that there is a reference level for HDR reference white, also diffuse white, also graphics white, and it is set at... Uh, at 203 nits, assuming that you have a signal of, uh, of about 1,000 nits. That's, uh, well, that's cl quite clear talk, and, uh, and, uh, and I, I, suspect, uh, I suspect that works uh, in, in principle, but at some, point, at some point, I had not looked at data, and I, I saw just the number, and I was thinking by myself, is, is, that, is that so? Is that, is that 203 nits? Why, why is that not 500 nits or 100 nits? I didn't know. And <coughs> what, what I also didn't know was that, uh, that there's now a clear trend in high dynamic range imaging, which is to, to measure statistics. This trend was started this morning by, uh, by Peter Rutje and carried on by the next two speakers. And in, in that good old tradition, I would like to present you uh, my statistics on diffuse white. Effectively, and the reason we can do this now, of course, is that now, now some content is starting to be available. Um, I cannot show you any of this content because, uh, because we, we do not own any of our, <laughs> of our content. It flows through our hands. I'm allowed to use it for statistical purposes. I cannot show you. This is also the reason I showed you that image before. I hope you enjoyed it because it was my only image. <coughs> um, so, so now the, the, the question really is now, is it, at what levels do you want to put Diffuse white. So diffuse white, in my mind, is uh, is a well illuminated patch of of white um, somewhere in the scene. So in, basically, all the pixels in that image you've shown. Um, where do we place it? At what level? Um, and 
well, I'm not going to tell you what level to, to, to do that, I don't know, but I would like to show you what, what I've measured uh, out of content that I happen to have. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping simply that these statistics can help, uh, can help the thinking. So let's, uh, let's start slowly, slowly, because I have a lot of time. I've had a word with my session chair. It turns out, um, well, I was thinking I could do this in 45 minutes. But I see on the clock now that I have 25 minutes, so there's, there's no, no real, real worry yet. Um, so I have three types of content. I'm only going to talk to you about one type of content. The other two are in grey on, uh, on this slide. If you want to read about it, I would suggest to, uh, to look at the paper. Uh, or you could look at uh, ITR report BT2408 in, in one of the annexes. Uh, there's uh, there's some, some test results there as well. Um, what's, uh, what, what's common with all these three tests is that there are a bunch of frames. I have some frames. And in these frames, there may or may not be diffuse white patches defined as being well illuminated white you know, uh, surfaces. Ideally diffuse, not, not specular. And I've just measured, you know, the click, click on a pixel and then it will tell you what the value was. So that's the interface that I've used. Um, what's different about the content that I want to talk to you about today is that I had content that was graded twice. First, an SDR grade was made. Second, an HDR grade was derived under the control of a colorist. Now, there was only one colorist involved with all of these frames, so if you have to point at a weakness in this research is that it's only one colorist, so in, in that sense it's one sample point, but it's over a whole variety of different types of content. Um, I will show you that in a second. Um, now, the HDR versions were created off the SDR versions initially by inverse uh, tone mapping, our own technology was used for that. And then, on top of that, a trim pass was, uh, was applied. So, in essence, both the SDR grade and the HDR grade were, were approved by the colorist. So, so, in that sense, in my mind, it matters less whether inverse tone mapping was involved or not, because anything that needed correcting was corrected afterwards anyway. So, the focus is on, uh, on that doubly graded content, so I will show you uh, statistics of diffuse white, both for SDR and HDR, in, in parallel, so you can get a feel for how this, this might progress. First, perhaps better to describe the content in a little bit more detail. So, here it is. Um, I'm sorry, this is a, just a very large table. Um, the data that came to me was uh, already pre-grouped uh, into uh, 15 different groups. Actually, it was 18 groups, but there was some, some unusable data there. There's 15 usable groups, uh, most of it HD format. Um, some groups were at 1280 by 720. This is uh, otherwise irrelevant for, for an assessment of reference levels. Um, the third row here shows you how many images, and it ranges from, uh, from about 10 images to about 332 images. Uh, and, and they are over a whole range of different topics. So, so the first four groups are talk shows, and then there's a four groups on uh, outdoor sports, uh, and then uh, some indoor sports. One very large group on, uh, on movie frames from a whole range of different movies. Um, there's also a nature group, um, and, and there was one uh, stand-up comedy show, which uh, I would imagine would be relatively similar to a talk show in terms of lighting. Um, so, so that's the distribution of, uh, of topics. Um, what I've done with all of these images, I looked at them uh, with a little interface that I wrote. I use uh, uh, MATLAB for this, uh, allowing me to simply click on the pixels that I would think are diffuse white pixels. Now, I helped myself a little bit by also making sure that uh, I would not, not ever click on an overexposed pixel. Um, because I false colored my overexposed pixels first. In my mind, an overexposed pixel is, uh, is any pixel that has a value of 254 or 255 in it. So this is another um, uh, point I'd like to make. I actually simply clicked on the SDR frames. I could have clicked on the HDR frames as well, but uh, in my mind it's more or less equivalent. Uh, SDR 
it, it was a choice. I could have done the other way. So with that, feel ready for the next slide. So I'm still characterizing just the data set, not, not the results yet. Um, what I've noticed is that uh, not all frames have diffuse white objects in them. Turns out that the talk shows pretty much all have, at least the ones that I had access to. Um, the exception is uh, group 13, uh, and if uh, I hope you have learned that table by heart by now, because it's kind of important, yes. Um, group 13 was, uh, uh, was the movie frames, uh, and group 14 was the nature show. And it turns out that there's just not that much diffuse white directly visible in those frames. So for, th for that reason, there's a whole lot of frames in these groups that are simply have no, no, no points clicked on them. So in essence, they were excluded from, from the analysis. As you're there. Um, so I've also looked at uh, how much is actually overexposed in these pixels. Now, given that everything started off as an SDR grade, I've only looked at the SDR images um, because uh, an overexposed pixel that does not automatically become not overexposed by inverse toe mapping. So as you can see, the between the groups, there's some, some reasonable variability in, in how many pixels are overexposed. Uh, I've expressed this as a percentage here, and it ranges from, uh, from very, very little for the nature show, uh, and also the movie frames, to uh, about 1.5% for, for one of the sports frame uh, sequences. So that's, uh, that's just for information. I was uh, pleasantly surprised to, to see in the movie frames how few overexposed pixels there are. You, you'd expect that because, because there's generally more control than in, in broadcast type content. So then the next set of slides are, are all of this form. Uh, here I've, uh, I've, I've, I'm actually not looking at luminance, I'm looking at RGB uh, uh, nit levels in essence. So it's, it's luminance but per red, green and blue channel. Uh, every bar has, uh, has a a mean, and around it uh, you see the, the standard deviation. And you see that the mean luminance for, for the SDR group uh, ranges uh, somewhere from about 10 to, uh, to you know, maybe about 15 nits or so, pretty low for the mean. Variance is quite high though, and that's uh, going to be a, a trend in this whole talk. <laughs> Variance of uh, what, what I measure is, is high of variability. Um, in HDR, the mean obviously goes up, and, uh, and we see that here to go up to, uh, to around 50, uh, 50 plus, 50, 75 thereabouts. Um, but also, there's a lot more variability in the mean and also the, the, the variance. I say variance, what I show here is standard deviation. Bon. Uh, so the, this is the data, and here's what I did with the data. Uh, as I said, I clicked pixels that looked diffuse white, uh, simply with a crosshair. Uh, I, I write the experimenter on these slides, but uh, you're looking at the experimenter. So there was not only one colorist, there was only also only one experimenter. Um, that's for convenience. I, I'm, I'm not sure that if, uh, if I made this into a full-blown psychophysical study, I would get a different result. But if you want to argue with me, you can, and I will freely admit I, I could have done a more thorough job. Um, and we only look at the SDR content, I've already mentioned that. Uh, so that gives me a whole lot of data, and now we can look at that, and I will give you uh, the, the, the most aggregated result first. Um, so I can now c calculate the mean luminance of uh, of all these diffuse white patches that I clicked. So remember, I excluded uh, obviously uh, shaded patches. If there was no direct illumination, I've, I've avoided it. And I've also avoided overexposed pixels. So on the SDR content, I would come out at around 60 candela per square meter. Um, that's what it was for this data set. Uh, and that goes to, uh, to an HDR value of well above above 350, 350 plus. Now that result is higher than in the other two data sets that I've measured. 
in fact, in the other two data sets, uh, I came out to about 200 candela per square meter. So the other two data sets that you can read in the paper and also in the ITR report, uh, you'll find that, uh, that the mean luminance level is pretty close to, to what you, what you, what's, what's effectively prescribed in BT2408. That's, that's kind of nice. Here, with this specific colorist, it seems that the luminance has gone up a bit. You can speculate as to why this is. This could be the preference of this colorist. could be the nature of the content. Some content, is, uh, as Pete has explained, is more amenable to HDR than others. Um, maybe this content was specifically amenable. That's possible. Um, but it could also simply be an artistic freedom that this colorist has taken. So, I'm hoping that this is not the last test on, on this topic for that reason. If you look at, uh, at how that goes per group, you'll see that uh, on the SDR, on the left, on the SDR uh, plots, everything sits more or less around 60. That's nice. It's, there's quite high uniformity there. Um, actually, more so than I expected, but, uh, but uh, SDR is well understood and, and, and Diffuse white seems to be around 60. With HDR, that seems to, to vary a lot more. Um, uh, it goes up to ooh, around 400, I would say. Um, but the, but the, even the mean between the groups is, is already starting to be wildly different. And of course, if you look at the, uh, the standard deviation, it's, uh, it's quite enormous. So the conclusion of this, uh, in my mind, is uh, diffuse white is, is all over the place at least in this data set. I've also looked at the actual range. Now, I don't want to show this for too long because the range, the minimum and the maximum, that's by definition an outlier. And outliers are not robust statistics. So this is just for illustration. Um, <laughs> the, the diffuse white in SDR takes about the whole range. It can be anywhere. Uh, and then in HDR, uh, it's even more so the case. However, I also want to point out that the number of, uh, no, I don't want to point that out. I was about to say something that was wrong. <coughs> ignore me. But actually, no, don't ignore me. That's not what I'm here for. Um, I'll give you a, a very brief discussion on this, and then I have a, a little bit of time left to talk about uh, not diffuse white, but also prefix white, which is uh, another form of white, but still, still quite white. So the mean SDR luminance, we found it to be around 60. That goes up to about 370 candela per square meter, assuming again a, a thousand nit signal. Uh, the consistency has definitely changed. Um, in SDR, there's a lot of consistency. In HDR, much less so. Seems to me that, that all that headroom that we've created with our HDR formats is going to be used, and it's going to be used in different ways. Not all content is going to be maximizing the, the capability of, uh, of the format or the display. Some of it probably needs to stay a bit lower. Some of it can go up. Um, and I think uh, that's roughly what we're hearing from, from our post-production guys as well. Um, in the beginning, we would, we would be asked to make an SDR grade followed by an HDR grade, which then should look as much as possible like the SDR grade. Uh, that's how it was a while ago. Now, slowly, 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 this is changing, and the SDR grade is, uh, is, going, to be, is going to fill the range a bit better, a bit more. And that's, that seems to be where it's going. And perhaps this, uh, these measurements are, are an example of this. Uh, however, perhaps not in mean luminance level, but certainly in, in the variance that I measure, uh, there's a, a confirmation of previous findings. There's an absolute very large variability in, uh, in, in results. So I also looked at graphics white because, uh, because I'm, now, I'm now starting to be good at looking at white. So I might as well look at a, a second kind of white. So for me, graphics white is... Uh, uh, graphical elements that are inserted later uh, in, uh, before broadcast typically. Um, and here, and remember that in 2408 there's no distinction between diffuse white and graphics white. It's all 203 uh, nits. 
However, what I found also in my previous studies is that uh, in this case, prefix white actually sitting a bit higher than diffuse white. So there seems to be a, a tendency to, to put this to put prefix white a bit higher. And here you see that's already the case in SDR, where um, prefix white sits around 80 nit from 60 uh, on diffuse white. And in HDR, that goes up quite a lot more. Uh, Prefix white sitting sitting quite high, surprisingly high, in fact, uh, here around 570 or so, give or take. So that's uh, that's surprising. Now the the remaining plots are, are definitely a bit less meaningful than the plots I've shown you before, and the reason is that in the data sets that I had, the number of points that uh, that had graphics white in it were were definitely a lot less. So. Uh, there's not an enormous amount of data. You can, for instance, see if you look at uh, bull, uh, group seven, the, the standard deviation is zero. What that effectively means is that there was only one data point in that whole set. Um, uh, you can also see in group uh, 14, there were about uh, two or three points. So uh, I, would not, I would not attach statistical significance to these results. I would, however, uh, uh, show them just, just just to see what I found, but, uh, but no, no hard conclusions can be drawn on this, I don't think. Now the range uh, is uh, relatively small, um, that's probably also because of lack of data, um, but, but from, from what it looked like looking at all these images is that uh, graphics white just tends to sit high, <laughs> fairly uniformly. And whether that's a trend or not, I don't think we can conclude from this, but at least I can I can show you something. So th the the numbers that came out for me then are uh, diffuse white sits at 60 in SDR and at 80 uh, for graphics white. So a bit higher already in SDR and for uh, in in HDR we go from 370 to about 570, assuming a thousand nit signal. That's uh, that's quite a quite a quite a big difference, I would say. So, so you, I, I really, you know, I'm, I'm still an academic at heart. I want to draw conclusions that are only valid. But you can also ask yourself, what what are the implications of this? Should we should we now always go and put everything at all our diffuse white at 203, or perhaps perhaps can we start thinking that perhaps a little range could be introduced? In my mind, that seems reasonable. Perhaps not everything needs to sit at exactly one level. Um, what I already hear from, uh, from other talks here at SIMTI is that, uh, that rules are there to be broken. And in that sense, I'm, I'm not worried. I'm, uh, I'm sure that, uh, that uh, the locals here in, in Hollywood uh, find, find sufficient rules here to be, to be broken. Um, I'm unsure if I have more slides. Perhaps I do. Oh, yeah, I do. That's good. So, um, I thought it was a kind of interesting study, at least for me, to understand uh, white a little bit better. I'm not sure if uh, I'm going to stick with uh, studies of white. I might, might move on to red or, or green, I don't know. Um, there's certainly limitations here. Um, the work is only one colorist, um, and a different colorist may do different things. A different studio may have different guidelines. There's all sorts of, all sorts of reasons for why this, uh, this study is incomplete. However, uh, it, uh, it confirms to a large extent uh, previous findings on, on the other data sets that you can also see in the paper. Um, however, it's also a little different c compared to the other studies in the sense that the mean luminance level that I found for HDR is, uh, is actually significantly higher than, uh, than the 200 that I found previously. Uh, not sure what, uh, what, what it means. I do believe, though, that uh, HDR offers, uh, offers greater artistic freedom, and we slowly start seeing that, uh, uh, that colorists and, uh, and directors of photography are starting to use it, and, uh, and I can only welcome that. So um, <coughs> I'm sorry that there was only one image, and I'm sorry I put it only at the start. Uh, I hope you found my plots interesting. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening, and uh, I'm happy to take any and all questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's very interesting, and um, 
obviously, as you say, it's very, very subjective to uh, creative intent or to a particular taste of the colorist. That being said, all the metrics that you use to draw the conclusions and show are, are uh, the amount of light, linear light, whereas the colorist, when he's looking at these images, is relying on his eyes to make these decisions. And we all know that the uh, response of the eye is very, very different than linear light. Just to be specific, um, 200 nits or 203 nits is not twice as bright in terms of what we see from what's there. So to me, it would seem very, if you're gonna draw these kinds of conclusions from the work, it would be very important to put a perceptual perspective on top of it. For example, uh, in terms of luminance, um, um, a, a Barton adaptation or a Barton curve on top of it so that we're more closely reflecting what the colorist actually sees. And I think that would really uh, alter the assumptions made here where we see the dispersion. If we look at the dispersion, the uh, statistical dispersion of the, the levels, it would show quite different results if we look at it through the way our eyes look at things. So I, I would think that would be a very interesting filter as opposed to looking at it as this pure linear light, which, I, I, which has been the way it's done on a couple other previous presentations that you were referring to. It was also looking at the data set as uh, linear light, which is the amount of energy being uh, uh, emitted, but it has no relationship to how our eyes respond to something. So. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It's a great suggestion. Uh, I'm, I'm well aware that uh, that uh, human vision is uh, is highly nonlinear. Uh, yeah, and yeah. And I mean, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So if you were to put that on top of the linear light and then uh, do the uh, comparisons, you would get quite a different uh, dispersion. So that uh, when you're saying, well, there's a lot of the scene data allocated at the lower end and HDR, not so much at the high end. That's uh, that would. Uh, probably explain why we're seeing some of these differences. Um, um, the other thing we have to remember, and this is something uh, when we start talking about uh, having absolute values for, say, uh, dispersed white or for 18%, uh, uh, we have to take into consideration, um, you know, the viewer adaptation. And uh, viewer adaptation can come from a couple of factors. One can be the ambient surround in the room, that sets sort of a finite level of adaptation. And then also scene ad adaptation, if you're looking at a really bright picture. So that's when we start talking about placing titles at a specific level. Um, I, I think that can be really problem problematic and it can be amplified when we're in HDR over SDR. If we got a really bright scene and we got a lot of uh, bright white levels, if we want the title to stand out over that, either we make it darker or we've got to bring this level up uh, probably up to the upper ends of HDR for it to have, for it to seem just as bright as it was over a dark scene where it would be, you know, way down. So that's something that I think hasn't been considered in a lot of these fixed standards where we're trying to say, well, we should put all titles at X, Y, Z, you know, a certain net level or something and uh, diffuse white should be at a certain net level. It really depends on uh, the room adaptation where that plays the best. I think, uh, I think one of the reasons that, uh, that this can still be difficult, especially with HDR, is that uh, uh, it's not, not completely clear what it is we're adapted to. Um, it, with an SDR screen, you're pretty much sure you're adapted to the, to the room, <laughs> not the display, because it's not yeah, brighter yeah, than the and, room. And an HDR screen, it depends in, in on HDR, the size. Yeah. It may be the room, it may be the screen, it depends on what's on the screen. Perhaps uh, uh, we have partial adaptation. Mm -hmm. None of that is very clear. As far as I understand in color science, partial adaptation is not very well understood. Um, so, so while this is a very, very interesting avenue of research, I have a feeling that that is still, still in academia, not, not yet ready to be directly yeah, so applied to, to problems such as this. And then that's the reason I've not done it uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. either. Well, but but it's it's very worth, worthwhile uh, avenue of research. There's no doubt about that yeah. in my mind. Well, I think it dispels the notion of uh, having these fixed limits that we should always place titles at this uh, particular level or something. I mean, it's really going to be dependent upon adaptation to this round and certainly adaptation to the picture or just simply, you know, you got to make it bright enough so that you can see it uh, over a, a, a moderately bright picture or, or vice versa. Yeah. Thank you for your comments, I appreciate it. Hi, Chris Seeger with NBC Universal. Uh, just bringing up uh, 
maybe some different rules for live linear workflows where diffuse white, graphic white serve as an anchor point. Um, and that anchor point helps us with conversion when we go to SDR and serve our legacy infrastructure. Uh, if you let that diffuse white, graphic white range go too high, uh, the conversion actually starts clipping out detail in, in the highlights as we go into SDR. And so I think we have to consider um, not moving that anchor point too much and following some different rules when, when we have to uh, work in a live linear workflow. I think you may be right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Thomas Edwards, Fox. Chris brings up a, a good uh, comment on going from HDR to SDR, but I'm just worried about making good looking live HDR sports and where we put the graphics level. And I am also getting the same feeling, although I don't have your data, but I'm getting the same feeling that our graphics levels have to be adaptive to the image. And I don't know exactly what it is in the image that makes us feel like, oh, that graphic level is now looking too, uh, too dim or that graphics level is looking too bright. Do you have any thoughts about how we can work in the, uh, the image uh, to get good graphics levels on, a, on an adaptive, continuous live uh, basis? So the, the the issue with graphics levels is that if you have a, a very bright scene, your 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 quite high graphics level may not be high enough uh, to to be easily readable. And if uh, if you put the same graphics level on a on a very dark scene or a shaded area, you you it may pop out so much that it distracts and 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 does the wrong thing. Um, Doing something adaptive is probably the right answer. I don't know that you can write adaptive in a, in a, in, a, in a guideline document because then you have to say how to do it adaptive. And anything that is adaptive is 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 good. You can engineer it to, to work really well. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of corner cases to deal with, and it's kind of hard to predict when you're going to run into such corner cases and doing that right in a robust way, that is not trivial. Difficult to standardize for that reason, but probably necessary to, to do in practice. That's my sense of it. But I may be wrong, eh? it's just one opinion. <laughs> um, Andrew Cotton, BBC. So back to graphics again, I'm afraid. Um, we've also noticed this tendency to, for people to put graphics really bright on the screen. So we've seen some station idents like that because it gives some sparkle to the image. A side effect of that is that, in my personal opinion, is that it tends to make the HDR underneath look rather dull and lackluster, uh, which is why we're fighting hard for those reference levels of 2408. I wonder whether you noticed the same in any of the content that you looked at, or whether your personal impression was that those 500 candela per meter squared graphics were, were right for the content. Yeah, so I, I looked at the data also I was not able to quantify my own opinion of the images I've looked at, unfortunately. Uh, it's it's kind of difficult to attach uh, value to, to, to the impression that you get. I did not specifically feel that the graphics was out of place. Um, also, I have to say, in this specific study, I, I looked at the SDR content. So I would have to look again at the HDR content to see if if my opinion, whether things have been pulled apart or not. Um, so, so while I have the data, I haven't looked at it in this way. So in that sense, I cannot really answer your question at this point. But it's a good idea. I should do that uh, afterwards. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marcelo Bertalmio, UPF. So um, did you find any sort of correlation between the um, level, white level, and the area of the objects having that Level? I didn't look for it. Okay. Uh, it's probably worth doing that. Um, I'm asking because it's it's a, a perceptual phenomenon that depending on the area you get to see uh, perceive the objects more or less uh, bright. So I was guessing that maybe that could account for the variance in in white level. I think it's a very reasonable suggestion for a follow-up study to see the areas I clicked in, how big were they, yeah. uh, and is there a correlation there. It's a, it's a good idea. Um, All right. I, I didn't do it at this point. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi there, Tim Bora, BBC. Um, if you've got, uh, from your results, if you've got um, SDR with a 
a diffuse white level of about 60 candelabras per square meter. Then you've got kind of less than one stop of headroom for SDR, which seems right. Um, but then I'm, I'm slightly confused by your results for HDR because certainly in some of those um, results you've, you've got uh, diffuse white levels that are 500, 600 candelabras per square meter, which is exactly the same ratio. Which, so I guess the question is, if you've got very high diffuse um, white levels in HDR, surely all you're doing is reproducing bright standard dynamic range pictures. Uh, they're not actually high dynamic range at all because they don't have much highlights. Do you have a comment on that? Um, it's, it's a s suspicion you could feel that, uh, at, at content in, in, in general, I would say. Um, for all the, all the data sets that I've, I've looked at, uh, I think it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's not across the board a conclusion I would want to draw. Uh, in certain cases, you could, you could think that, possibly. Um, but in this particular case, the data was, uh, was over a large range of groups. Uh, some was sports, some, some talk shows, some uh, 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 movie frames, quite a lot of movie frames, in fact. And, um, and I, I don't think that's a conclusion I would draw for, for across the board, no. Well, maybe uh, your colorist just had a preference for the SDR look for some types of content. Yeah, there's a personal element involved uh, in this study because it was only, only one colorist. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I've, I've tried to be very clear about that so that, that you, you can interpret the data in that way if, if, if you want. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please tap the like button and also subscribe to our channel to receive notifications when we add new content. For more information about us, please visit simti.org. We'll see you next time.